Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Desk.com, the all-in-one customer support app for fast-growing companies. Visit Desk.com slash twist to get your service desk up and running today for as low as $3 per month. And by Wistia, take control of your video marketing with powerful tools and analytics built specifically for business. Go to Wistia.com slash twist to get your free Wistia account today. And by AWS Activate. It's easy to start and scale your business with Amazon Web Services. Check out free resources like one-on-one office hours with AWS Solutions Architects and much more. Learn more and sign up at aws.amazon.com slash activate. Hey, everybody. I've said it before. I'll say it again. We're living in the age of excellence. Design matters. People want to consume beautiful products. But how do you learn how to make a beautiful, delightful product? Well... There's a person named Eve Bahar who I know as one of the most talented visionary designers in the world. He's done amazing chairs for Herman Miller. He's done amazing products for Jambox and Jawbone, uh, the August Lock. I mean, this is the guy. I mean, this is the guy Steve Jobs couldn't hire, basically, is what I would say. He wouldn't say that, but that's what I would say. He's a brilliant designer. He sat down with me at the launch festival, and you are now going to get to experience the brilliance of one of the world's greatest designers, uh, Eve Bahar. Really, please enjoy this episode and tell me what you think. I'm at Jason on Twitter. That's what it's all about, man. They said, funny is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like people until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. One thing we've noticed over seven years of doing this event is that design has become of paramount importance. Ten years ago, people thought design was not all that important. What mattered was just getting a product out, and Craigslist, and eBay, and just very simply designed sites were the model. Boy, have things changed in startups. What you build has to be awesome and beautiful. And I've made friends with a guy named Eve Bahar, who's just an amazing designer. And um, I asked him to come and just talk about design for a little bit so we can all sort of level up. So please welcome me and welcoming Eve Bahar. Welcome, my friend. How are you? I'm good. I've never followed a four-year-old before. It's a tough act. You know, they say never know, work with kids tough. or animals. <laughs> <laughs> Hard act to follow. So now you've designed a lot of the beautiful things that some of the people in the audience have used. How many people here own a jawbone or a uh, jam box? Jam box? Wow. I thought more people own jam boxes. Um, so, and um, Ouya, August. Um, one laptop per child, a bunch of things you've been designing. How long have you been designing? How long have I been designing? Yeah. Um, probably since I was 16 years old. Yeah. Um, so it's been over a long time, I mean, almost 25 years, 30 years. Yeah. And, and when did you start designing for actual consumer products that were in the market? Um, so I moved, I moved to, to, to California from Switzerland um, in the early 90s. And um, I started working as a, you know, for, for, for bigger consulting firms uh, around that time. And, you know, the reason why I moved to, to Silicon Valley in San Francisco is essentially I saw this whole area of technology. And it really needed, in my opinion, um, uh, you know, it really needed sort of a, a different approach, right? I mean, these things were not designed for your home. They were not designed for your life. Um, and they weren't being thought out, you know, from a design standpoint. It was speeds and feeds, it was engineering, um, it wasn't about how, you know, you were going to have these products around in your everyday life. Um, so, you know, plus there were jobs here, so... <laughs> that works too. That works too, so that's, that's how I started out here. And you've seen the industry change in the last 20 years, from the early 90s. When you started working with technology companies, how did the technologists, how did the founders look at design? Well, in the 90s, there was really no, you know, deep interest in design. It was sort of, um, you know, just, it was just very much like being a, a decorator of something that had already been conceived. Um, you, you would come at the very last minute, 
um, they, they didn't really see the, the, the value in design outside of just prettifying something at the end. Um, obviously, things have changed 360 degrees. Um, whether it's um, a job on, whether it's at the startups you mentioned, um, design and use and um, user experience is something that is spoken about from the very beginning. Um, it's, it's part of how you choose with which features go into a product, um, you know, where it's going to live on the body or in your life. It's, uh, it's part of what you're going to say about a brand. It's, it's really very much at the center of the discussion today. How have consumers changed in the last 20 or 30 years? Because, especially American ones, it seemed like 30 years ago, again, people were buying cars based on horsepower or maybe the windows going up and down electrically, but not design wasn't even that important back then. How, have, how has the American consumer's palette uh, changed in the last 30 years? So that's another incredible transformation. When I first moved to, um, to the US, you know, all, my, all my friends and associates and, uh, you know, in Europe said, well, why are you going there? You know, uh, uh, there's no design in America. There's no, you know, mm -hmm. America is like, I mean, design is Paris, Milan, or London, uh, or England, and, um, and there is really, you know, very little that you, you're going to be able to do there. Um, and what I've seen is the transformation of the American consumer at every level, whether it's at Target, whether it's, um, you know, in, 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 you know, in high end, at the low end, at, at, at every possible level, whether it's in technology, right? Where now I think San Francisco and the Bay Area is one of the capitals of, designs in the, of design in the world, which was not the case before. So what do founders need to understand about design when they're making a product? If you could boil it down to sort of fundamentally what to think about when you're making software, you know, if you're making Uber, or if you're making Facebook or Twitter or social network, where do you start to just say, how does design play a role? Well, you know, for me, my, my wide definition of design, which is a good filter for this, is essentially it's how you treat your customers. If you treat your customers from a you know, from an ergonomic standpoint, from a user standpoint, from an emotional standpoint, if you treat them well, you know, throughout the different experiences they have with your, with your idea, with your company, um, then you're probably practicing good design. And so it's, it's as fundamental as, um, you know, the functionality that essentially you're, you're, you're trying to have people adopt in their lives. So, so thinking about the behavior of the user and how to make that interaction more pleasant, more beautiful, more seamless? Those are good words, but I would say more relevant, um, you know, wow. relevant in their, in, in their lives. There is a lot of sort of ideas and features and, you, you, you know, when you're starting a company, you are at the crossroads, um, um, you, you're making all these decisions. And if you're making these decisions, you know, based um, solely on what technology you own, and not on sort of how, how people are actually going to live with your technology, then you're forgetting about a very important aspect of why people will love or not love um, your product. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you to my friends at Wistia for making a beautiful product for video uh, syndication and hosting. Now, many of you know I've used YouTube for a long time, but I wanted to have a more powerful player, a more powerful, customizable, just better experience that wasn't like the ugly, disgusting YouTube experience on my own websites. Like, so when you go to This Week in Startups, I wanted to have a big, beautiful, HD quality, um, I control all the buttons and the frame, uh, you know, sort of style. I didn't want to just throw the YouTube embed up there. It looks ugly and I can't really customize it a lot. So I tweeted, who is the best? I don't know who the best is anymore. I, I you know, haven't really looked into this. And I got 50 people who responded back to me. Oh my God, you have to try Wistia, you have to try Wistia. So I try it. And then I start seeing the crazy statistics and metrics they have. And I'm like, wow, this blows YouTube's metrics out of the water. So take a look here on my screen. It was great. Like we tweet, hey, here is the Uber Travis um, 
uh, interview and I can see and this has just been released how many people uh, where they're watching it where they're from how many minutes of it they watched and then did they watch you know did they watch it twice etc and I can see all of my different uh, shows and how many views they're getting and it really worked great um, I have to say it's a wonderful product and a big beautiful high quality player it, it just looks so much better than YouTube uh, on your site so it's clean it's gorgeous and you can control it so the thing I love is we put a little uh, roadblock in the at the beginning and somewhere in the middle that says hey would you like to get email updates about this week in startups and it's got a clearly labeled skip button but it sort of prompts people like hey if you like this content you made it to minute 30 maybe you want to give us your email address so we can tell you about other stuff we're doing people do it and then we wind up getting dozens and dozens and dozens of extra subscribers per week and compounded, hey, you know, that equals thousands a year. And now you have your independence from YouTube or from other people. And so I'm using Wistia because I love the metrics and I love capturing people's email addresses. To me, each email address is worth at least 25 subscribers on YouTube. So anyway, it's an amazing platform. I love it. 50,000 people are using it. Literally, they have 50,000 customers, including people like MailChimp, Blank Label, Moz, oh, just tons of people you know. Amazing analytics, capture emails, lots of support if you run into trouble, and you can start your free account today, Wistia, W-I-S-T-I-A, dot com slash twist, Wistia dot com slash twist, no credit card required, and the first five videos are free. Let's get back to this amazing episode. Let's talk about this one. Um, this is the... This is, this is the latest uh, Jambox. So, so, you know, Jabon is, is a company that I've been a partner in and, and um, chief creative officer for now 11 years there, and, um, you know, we've... We went from making Bluetooth headsets um, and making them different, making them, you know, having people actually adopt them into in in their lives in a different way, um, to using Bluetooth technology for speakers. And at the time, um, in the United States, 16 million docks were being sold every year. You took your phone and you, you know, your mobile device with all of its media and all of its. Um, and you plugged it into some place and made it immobile, made it kind of stay in a single place. Um, and that's what the Jambox sold for people, but in a very simple way. Uh, it had very, you know, few buttons. It kind of it put itself to sleep, you know, by itself. It, it had 12 hours battery. Like all these things were, you know, very much considered um, from, a, from, a, from a user experience standpoint and from a design standpoint. And that's what it became kind of the reference, the, 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 the first commercial kind of success around, around Bluetooth uh, speakers. It also had a certain feel to it. The material was different than anything I had felt before in a consumer electronic right. device. Can you talk a little bit about how you came to the material, this rubbery kind of nice feeling rubber in your hands. So, so it was built for portability. And, um, you know, I think at the time what was interesting was uh, music was something that you really experienced in a selfish manner, you know, with headphones or headsets. Um, and everything was in there, in your head. And suddenly when people discovered they could travel with it, they could take it to places, um, they could bring it into uh, life experiences that they had not considered having music in before, um, it, it, it became something different. And that's why the materials were conceived with sort of rubber and metals and um, in a way that is robust but yet friendly for, for carrying it around, for transportation. Um, and, and, you know, the result is, you know, I've, I get letters and, you know, notes and pictures from people who are, you know, who've put music in incredible places, like in the delivery room, right? Like, like people who said, well, you know, because there was a jam box there, you know, we had this rocking, you know, delivery of of, uh, our, of our new kid, or at a at a you know proposal on the on the beach, you know, somebody proposing on the beach. I mean, you hear all these stories where suddenly people took music um, to a place where they didn't used to be some. And uh, maybe we can go to the next slide and look at another. So yeah, this this is you just asked me to put a few slides together. Yeah, of things just of stuff of some recent kind of favorites. This is the uh, the campaign we did with uh, Jurgen Teller, a fashion photographer in Europe, uh, around the around the mini jam box, which is as you can see in this guy's shirt is very small and even 
you know, ab about half the size as the current. Um, as but it the, produces as the, the same amount of sound as the previous generation. Is that correct, or close to it? It's close, and it's a very clear sound. We made it out of uh, extruded aluminum uh, because. It's, it, it, it allows us to have a very small enclosure, but very rigid enclosure, with as much, um, you know, with, with as, as much room inside. What you what you need for good sound is as much is, is, you know, uh, room inside. That's why bigger speakers sound better than smaller ones. But here, what we did is actually create a very large enclosure relative to the amount that the overall product, the amount of space the overall, the overall product takes. So the aluminum extrusions are one point two millimeter thick. And this is something that you cannot do with plastic. You know, you can't go that thin uh, with plastic. Um, what else? This is my way to bring my, uh, yeah, my, kid, on, my yeah. kid on stage. But this is the one laptop a child. And is that your son? This is my son. Oh, yeah. wow. Um, but this is the one laptop a child. And, and this is a tablet we launched. This is a seven and a half inch. Um, $149 tablet. And then there's a 10 and a half inch version with a um, with a detachable magnetic keyboard as well that just launched. But you know, this is one of these programs where technology really went around the world and where people saw design as a way to not just sell you know, here in the US or in Europe, but to have you know, kids all around the world love, um, you know, love, love a, a technological product. That's really designed for them. And what we're seeing there is those are the original version, the one That's the original out, version which is of the, the laptop. laptop. Did you yeah. design that as well? Yes. So I've been working with Nicholas Negroponte and the OLPC team for seven years or so. We went through the entire adventure uh, from, 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 from the early days. Um, but there's three million of these in the world now. Uh, in some countries, every child from the age of 6 and 18 years old has one, for example, in Uruguay. Um, in places like Peru, there's a million laptops that kids are using. So it's, it's been remarkable. And recently, I just received, um, two weeks ago, a banknote from uh, Rwanda with the one laptop per child actually on the banknote. On really? The, on the 500 francs uh, in Rwanda. So, well, that's amazing. Um, is that Nicholas in the middle of that photo, or you, or who's no, the this blue is, shirt? I think this is the CEO um, uh, uh. of, um, I mean, uh, uh, it's the regional uh, head of, the, of this um, uh, Peruvian uh, school district. The, the device was, in the, in the first iteration, I remember, had a crank on the side to, to crank up the battery. Those were very early ideas, yes. Yeah, and also had a mesh network antenna so they yep. could connect to each other. So some of these ideas remained, yeah. and some didn't. So the crank didn't, but the mesh network antenna remained. Was yeah. the crank unnecessary because people had found other solutions for electricity? So what we, wanted, what we decided in the end is like localization was very important. So some places had you know, uh, uh, difficulties in getting access to electricity. And for those, we have you know, cranks that are separate from the laptop. But in a lot of places like Uruguay and Peru, electricity is not really an issue. So um, you don't want to burden the product with a heavy and expensive mechanical piece yeah. for all cases. And why did it go from a laptop to a tablet, I wonder? Um, so everything we learned in the laptop, you know, how kids interact with the product, how protected it needs to be and durable, um, how the software, you know, needs to be sort of intuitive and easy to use, is something that we you know, easily, we, we could transfer and do just as well on a tablet. And for younger kids, uh, typing on a keyboard is less important. So that's why we have a couple of different tablets. One which is this, the seven and a half inch, which is better for younger kids. And then one with a detachable keyboard for, um, for older studies. These young kids who are growing up on tablets, how do you think their design sensibility, their way of looking at the world is going to change? Well, so, so in the developing world, um, people are used to getting hand-me-downs, right? They're used to getting sort of second-hand products that are, you know, recycled from, from, from here and other places. When they get in contact with something that is designed specifically for them, with materials and textures and features that they really need, um, it completely changes their view on um, on the world and and um, on you know how the world kind of sees them how you know how the world sees them as a as a valuable 
you know, assets rather than someone who, you know, receives a hand-me-down of, of, uh, ah, of so something. So just the act of getting something new in a box. Absolutely. That's is, very important to true. everyone, you know, in every culture. The unboxing, as it were. Absolutely. So let's see the uh, next slide. Yeah. Um, this is a more recent project, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with. Um, and I wanted to connect this with a couple of things that we'll, we'll, we'll you know, talk about. But this whole world of um, connected devices that, 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 um, that are sort of a 24-hour experience is uh, something from a design standpoint that's both extremely challenging, um, but also extremely rewarding, because we've discovered that so many, so many people see a tremendous amount of value in, in learning about their data and owning their data. And, and when you designed this one, tell me a little bit about the approach, because I remember the Nike one was very rigid, it locked in place. Right. You had to have an extender and size it, and right. um, you decided to go with more of a wraparound sort of right. system here. So this was the first, um, you know, kind of uh, a sleep and physical activity tracker that was on your wrist. Mm -hmm. um, it was the very first one. Yeah. And, um, you know, before that, you would have them on your belt or you would sort of clip them in different places on the body. And our point of view was that we wanted, you know, we always want 24-hour wearability. And for 24-hour wearability, what you want is sort of flexibility, uh, softness. You want it to kind of fit on, on the body in a way that is secure, but not, you know, like a handcuff, not something, you know, hard yeah. and rigid. Um, the other thing we, we, we know is the flexibility of the wrist is very important. And as the wrist becomes smaller, especially with women, um, it's, it's, it's critical that if you have something thick, it starts to impede on, um, on the movements of the wrist. So narrowness of the device, softness of the enclosure, um, um, it was, was a, you know, probably the very first criteria, dictated very much by design and user experience. And what do you think of the, the watch space now? We, you've seen the Samsung watch, yep. the first version, pretty large. I'm assuming you take a look, took a look at it. What was your impression of the, the watch? So for me, the watch is probably the most kind of important, um, you know, physical accessory or, 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 you know, personal accessory people have had in the last, you know, 100 years. Um, and, you know, it's, it's one that I think will continue to live as such. Um, a, lot of, um, a lot of young people actually want to wear watches, like, you know, typical, traditional watches. Um, but the, the notion that you're going to take every functionality that's on a cell phone or on a smartphone and you're going to cram that into a watch that fits on your wrist, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure this is, this is where I would go. Um, you know, I do think that technologies can be more discreet um, on the body, and I'm not sure we need like a full, you know, interface, uh, watch-like, you know, phone-like interface on, on our wrists. Well, I, th I think I have be? yet to yeah. see something that's going to be, that's compelling. What would your, in broad strokes, ideal functionality be on a, on a watch? Well, I think the functionalities that we're going to be looking for, um, you know, in, in, um, in, 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 the, in the years to come are going to be very diverse from uh, health data to uh, more kind of lifestyle data, you know, to, to, to other types of information. Um, and so, so I don't know that we all want the same thing when it comes to personal accessories. It's not like a phone. It's not like a laptop. Um, what you wear on your body is just what you need. Um, you don't want all the extraneous sort of functionality. So I, th I think um, it's going to be more broken up into things that you want and things that I want in your style and my style. Ah. It's less of a kind of, you know, everybody with the same logo and the same product. Um, so it won't around. be an iPhone phenomenon where there's one for everybody and that will slow adoption? It. You hmm? think it will slow adoption, it will take more time than people maybe anticipate? You know, some people will want, you know, uh, uh, an Apple or Samsung watch, but I don't think it will be as general or as, as um, hmm. you know, as, um, you know, uh, common as far as everybody wearing or using the same thing as these other products. I wonder what you think of the first iteration we've seen of Google Glass. 
Mm -hmm. um, you've played with it on a design basis, on a functionality basis. What do you think? Well, I think it's, I think it's an interesting technology when you think of, of B2B applications. I think it's an interesting product when you think of surgeons, when you think of um, stockists, when you think of this, this kind of world. But I, I, I don't think it's, um, it's something that I'm, we're going to see a lot of people here or anywhere um, kind of use on a, on a regular basis. And the, the, the reason is, you know, it, it doesn't mean that kind of technology doesn't have a future. It just needs, means that it needs to be designed in a way that will be, um, again, diverse and not obtrusive from a, from a, you know, from a social standpoint, from a, um, you know, from a human standpoint. The interaction with right. the glasses on you see right. is problematic in some way? Or? It's problematic, and, and, and I think it's problematic just like, for example, Segway was problematic. Uh -huh. uh, because when you ride a Segway around, you're about a foot taller than everybody else. That's not a natural interaction. I mean, the way you need to think of products, in my opinion, is you need to think of them as extending the natural interactions that we're having, um, um, that we're having, you know, that we used to, that are, you know, you know, millions of years old in a way. So um, if the Segway had been, you know, tiny little wheels and flat again, more flush against the ground and only added, you know, a couple of inches to people's height, do you think it actually would have become more adopted? I mean, that's where I would have started. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you think that product didn't, I mean, there, there was an example of a product that was fairly well designed, I think you would agree, it looked beautiful at least, mm -hmm. and had tremendous technology and had had zero adoption with the exception of cops or right. you know, mall cops. Right. Or well, it's not, uh, it's not surprising that cops liked it because the cops used to get on horses and kind of control crowds and yeah. you know, direct traffic from a higher you know, point of view. So you can see that that's a natural adoption. Right. Just like for uh, non-cops, for regular human beings, eye contact is important. Um, you know, if I was seating on the ground and you were seating on this chair, you yeah. know, it, it would feel odd. You would feel right. odd and I would feel strange, right? Yeah. So that's why we're sitting at the same level. Like those very human um, moments of interaction and experience, um, in a way, you know, technology needs to be very cognizant of that and uh, enhance that rather than take some of that away. Ah, uh, yes. We have a new partner here at This Week in Startups, and that partner, partner is Desk.com. Desk.com is like customer support help desk kind of thing, uh, you know, software as a service, and all of these requests that come in, like, oh, my God, my This Week in Startups, you know, RSS feed is broken. Oh, my God, you know, this is broken, that's broken. You get all these complaints from people, right, constantly, and they don't just do it on email quietly. They're doing it on Twitter, on Facebook, and then you're wondering, like, did somebody in the organization organization respond to this person or not, well, that's what desk.com does great. You get a 360 degree view of your customers uh, in one universal inbox. What that means is everybody in the organization can see what people are saying about your product. And this could be by phone, it could be by email, it could be through the social channels. And then you can sort of dispatch it. You take care of this one, I'll take care of that one. What happened? Did somebody get back to this? It just makes customer support, which is so important. I mean, listen, Tony Shea wrote about it at Zappos, right? Delivering happiness. It's so important important to get customer service right because those people who are vocal enough to go on Twitter and Facebook, you know in the real world they're telling everybody either your product sucks or it's great based upon how you treat them. And those people who are haters, or in my case, jaders, those people, when I engage them and they're like, oh my God, you're terrible, then I engage them and they're just like, I love you. They become super fans. And that's what Desk.com will help you do. Convert the haters or the people who are complaining or the people who are upset, making sure they don't slip through the cracks, and then you convert them into awesome, awesome super fans. Um, they have powerful mass response and editing features that save you a ton of time. You can make your own like little help desk, you know, self-service. Here are the commonly asked questions, frequently asked questions. And it's only three bucks a month. Give me a break. It's so affordable. Head to desk.com slash twist, desk, D-E-S-K dot com slash twist, and help improve 
uh, your customer support agents, productivity, uh, and route feedback to the product management teams. And by the way, it all integrates with Salesforce. So if the sales team is selling something and then people are complaining about it on the customer support side, you, you, you kind of can thread the needle on those two things and the, the sales folks and the customer support people can start to see the full relationship. I think that's why Salesforce bought this awesome company um, is so that you get that full life cycle of the customer type thing. It's really amazing. It's a great product. We're going to uh, implement it here at This Week in Startups and at the Launch Festival. Um, and we're actually going to probably use it at Inside.com as well because it's so affordable. Why wouldn't you do it this way? Go ahead and try uh, desk.com slash twist and go ahead and thank them at desk on Twitter. We'll see you. Uh, oh, let's get back to the program. It's a great, great episode. Um, oh, here we go. The lock. So, so the other thing that I've, you know, I've, I've, I've focused on in the last few years are um, being a co-founder or being a partner in a few other uh, type of startups. So, so not just for hire, but like actually starting your own companies. Exactly. And I think that's very important when you're a founder, and I believe there's a lot of founders here, yeah. or people who aspire to be founders, is to find the right partners. Just like you're looking for the best engineering talent, just like you're looking for the best coder on your team. Um, I was talking to a founder out there uh, in one of your booths, and he was like, well, you know, I trained myself on, uh, you know, Illustrator and Photoshop in the last couple of months, and I did it all myself. Look, you know, look at the logo and look at the, yeah. you know, uh, look at the booth, look at the design. And I was like, well, did you do this, you know, did you learn to code and did you, like, you know, decide to, like, do all the coding, you know, uh, yeah. uh, uh, on, your, on your product yourself? And did you, it's, it's like you, you need to sort of surround yourself with the best possible talent. Um, and this is what I, I love to do, which is to work with founders. In this case, I co-founded uh, August with uh, Jason, uh, Jason Johnson. Um, and there's a few of these companies. I mean, one of the ones that just launched, this is, this is still in the works. Uh, August is still in the yeah. works. But one of the ones that just launched is called Game Golf. And it launched with the PGA and, uh, and the Golf Channel. Um, and it's doing incredibly well. It's a way to track your golf games. Um, in a very sort of exact fashion. Um, and it's, so it's a very specialized kind of application if you think of golfing, but, um, you know, people... Is it an app or is it a physical device? It's both an app and a physical device. Ah, so um, it's hardware-enabled app. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this is, this is the case in all, all these projects, right? Whether it's, um, you know, Job Owner August, the, the, the um, you know, the, the user interface, the, the sort of... The physical and digital parts are, are, are sort of critical in equal ways. Let's talk about this specific product. Um, I felt it. It's, it's a nice, heavy, strong feeling product, and it looks very industrial, modern. What was your inspiration for the lock, and how does it work with a deadbolt? So it fits, so the August Smart Lock fits on a door, on the inside of your door. Okay. So it doesn't change the visual aspect of, you know, your entry and your door. Um, and that you, was still, very, you still keep the key. You can still use a regular key, which, is, which was a very important criteria for us. On the inside, it essentially is, is fixed uh, where your deadbolt uh, used to be. All you have to do is remove your deadbolt and, and add the August uh, Smart Lock. And then it's made out of materials. Here I'm showing it in red just to have it kind of, um, kind of jump out. Right. But we also make it in silver and black um, uh, just so that it sort of fits within the environment. The goal here isn't to create something that's going to be completely different and separate from the things you know, like the, the, the metal of the hardware and your doors. Um, you know, people care about, about, um, yeah. about those things. So we made it out of aluminum. Um, it's, it's, it's really going to be, you know, just this very beautiful but very simple and understated object, um, you know, inside your door. Unless you want it in red, which is what I'm showing here. <laughs> and so what happens uh, on your phone when you walk up to your door, it unlocks, it knows it's me? Or? So one thing, one thing I've been very interested in is, um, and, and one thing that I believe is we spend way too much time on our phones, um, unlocking them opening apps, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really kind of become a burden in some ways, right? Yeah. Um, people are looking for l using less apps, not more apps. So what I'm interested in is invisible interfaces. Yes, you can go control your lock and decide who comes in and out and send keys through the, through the, you know, through the, through the app, through the interface. But 
in your daily use, which is, you know, you go in and out of your house five or ten times a day, um, um, you should be doing nothing. It's just the phone is in your back pocket, you walk towards your door, it unlocks it, there's enough of a vibration and a chime, you know, you can decide where the vibration and where the chime is, whether it's coming from the lock or coming from the phone, and you get you, get a, uh, uh, you just get enough subtle notification that you know the door is unlocking and you, you're walking in. You're not going to smash your head on the door. Right. Um, and and um, that's what I'm really interested in, is how to start using um, the technologies that are all around us and to use, you know, in this case, Bluetooth LE in a way that becomes just very subtle and com absolutely non-disruptive to, 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 to your everyday life. What are some other ideas around this invisible interface that you've been thinking about? Like, are we going to be walking up to our coffee machines and if we pause in front of it for long enough, it knows to drop uh, the espresso? Well, that's one way to, to think of it. So, right. so I, I do believe, like, especially in our home environments, we don't need more disruptions. We don't need more screens. Um, what we want is, is what we're competing with when it comes to technology. What we're competing with is the light switch. All I have to do is find it, which can be a pain, uh, but then I push it and the lights are on, right? And if it's any more complex than that, if it requires any more thinking, it's probably not going to get wide adoption. So, so I try to measure you know, things like August and, and uh, other, other projects we're working on against this, um, you know, high bar, which is, is it more complicated than a light switch? And if it is, we probably need to simplify it even more, make it more intuitive than that. And so this is August's first product. You haven't announced a second August product yet, or you have? No. No. But no. we can, you're going to make a connected home? Is this the first in a series of uh, devices? Well, we're very focused on the, on the, um, on the door and on the smart lock because it's, 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 it's a huge problem for people. I mean, they, you know, there's no one you ever go talk to who you're going to say, well, we're working on something to replace your keys who doesn't immediately come back to you and says, I hate keys. Right. Um, and, um, uh, you know, so I'm, we're really focused on that, but there is no doubt that, you know, literally, uh, and metaphorically, the, the smart lock is the entry to your home. Right. There's many things that happen um, once, you know, there's, a, there's an identity recognition that happened at the yeah. door, and with identity, you can do lots of things. So, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm fascinated about how all the ways in which this lock can start to unlock um, yeah. other Yeah, well, other I mean, if you know it's home. me coming in the front door, I might like my lights a certain way or you might anticipate I'm going into a certain room or something. Right. There's, there's a, a lot of logical places we could go with that. Okay, we have another slide. Yeah. Um, Chair, you asked me to bring a few things that yeah. I'm like, excited about. I mean, I'm always, I always love seeing a lot of the startups and a lot of the companies using a Herman Miller chair. But this is an maybe an important point. Herman Miller, for the ones who don't know it, is a company that's been around for, um, you know, for probably 80, 80 plus years, 90 years. And it's a company that's done incredible, incredible design work that really represents America historically uh, for design, right? If you think about the Eames chair and the, you know, the Eames chairs and the Eames, um, uh, you know, designs over the years and partnership with them. If you think of George Nelson, if you think of, um, you know, just, just the legacy of what they have created. You go anywhere in the world and you can see those products all the way to the Aaron chair and, 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 and more recently the sail chair. This is a company that's never had an internal design team, never in the last 80 years. Yet they represent America, you know, historically, you know, uh, for design. And so whether you have an internal team, let's say like Apple, or a team made of people you work with for a lifetime, you know, great partners, what really sort of makes you know, these two companies exceptional is their commitment to design, their commitment to being um, the best possible resource to creating you know, breakthrough 
uh, breakthrough yeah. products, breakthrough inventions, breakthrough. Was this um, one yours or just one? This is this is our design. Yes. You, oh, so this is your design. Yeah. H how did you um, come to this one, the sale? So it's the sale, right? This is a sale chair. Yeah. Um, what I was looking for is um, I only have one picture of it here, but it's a task chair that um, really delivers all of what you get out of an errand chair but with less materials and um, at, at a much lower price point, about half of the price point that's typical. Um, and to do so, I had to remove the frame. What typically happens in an office chair is that you have a frame, and it's usually a frame that people complain, you know, it's like either holding foam or holding a mesh, but you can't feel it. it it's kind of in the way. So I got inspired by bridge construction, um, and this and specifically about, you know, from the Golden Gate Bridge, and, um, and uh, suspended a material on tension to that structure. Um, uh, and this, this created the first frameless uh, suspension, you know, material. Um, and it's quite comfortable, but you would have to try it. Yeah. Um, so this is, the other thing you asked me to bring is a couple of projects that that I may have worked on design, but that never actually happened. Right. And this is something that I've probably never shown at a conference, but um, it's called a learning shoe. And this dates back to 1998 or 1999. It's and a shoe. It's a shoe. It, it's, a commission from, um, it's a commission from the Museum of Modern Art, who, who came to the design studio and said, when, when it was barely founded, when it was like a few months old, and who said, well, no, give, us a, give us a direction for the future of the shoe. And what, I, what we thought about then is a shoe that had a chip inside it. This is a diagram that dates back to that time. Yep. That has a chip inside it. It doesn't matter what the shape of the shoe is. We right. just showed some like, exciting California you know, beach flip-flop thing. Um, but, but it has a chip inside it. And it collects information about how you walk, how much you walk. Um, whether you're gaining weight or losing weight, your pronation, um, and then you you turn in the shoe back to the to the manufacturer, and they make a, a new one, a better one for you next time. Um, and this this really changes the relationship between manufacturer and user because you're not just purchasing a one-off product. What you're purchasing is a better experience over time. This is before the word. Um, you know, the Internet of Things. Or wearables. Or wearables. Was, even existed. Even existed. But this is, this is the kind of, I, I mean, I love looking back at this project because in many ways, yeah. things that, you know, Up does or things that Game Golf does, um, things that August, you know, uh, uh, will do are, um, are, are contained in some of, in, in that diagram in some ways. This mass customization was something in the 90s, specifically when you were actually were working on this, that people thought would become like a, a very much a part of daily life. That yep. we would, you know, a factory would make something just for us. Has that really not panned out and why do you think? I think in some ways it has panned out. If you look, I mean, it hasn't panned out, it didn't pan out for a long time, and part of it was the cost of putting uh, sensors or communication technology in, in, in our everyday objects was, was high, but now that cost has come down quite a bit. Um, the cloud has also enabled ideas like this. Back then, I wasn't thinking so much of the cloud, I was thinking of you remove this back. chip, yeah. you ship it back, you recycle it, they recycle the shoe for you, and then you get, you get a better product. But um, in many ways, the, the, the ability of, of you know, the Bluetooth, for example, and other, um, um, you know, other, other communication formats to, to transfer quick data back and forth is really allowed for customization. I mean, this product, you know, the app band, really gives me customized advice and feedback um, on, my, you know, on my lifestyle um, every single day. Yep. Um, and that is a form of customization. That is a right. form of interaction that, that didn't exist then. What, what do you think of this hardware revolution that we're seeing? Many of the startups who we've seen here at the event today are um, hardware-based, and the cost of manufacturing, prototyping, and uh, even raising money through Kickstarter has just plummeted and the opportunities increased. Yeah. Um, 
if this had existed 15 years ago when you're starting, you could have just actually made that product probably. Some people came to us back 15 years ago and, and uh, were very interested in it um, and are telling us 15, 15 years later that it's, it's about to happen. <laughs> really? <laughs> um, so, but what's, but yes, so, so the change has been drastic. I mean, um, hardware has become a way to really uh, manifest the presence of technology on, a, on, a, on an everyday basis at every stage of, 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 of our lives. And um, the kind of data you can derive from sensors and um, uh, you know, sort of uh, multiple types of different sensors is going to be you know, incredible. I mean, I, I do believe it's going to change healthcare. Which is one. This is one um, yeah. uh, idea around it, but I do believe that it's going to change healthcare in ways that, um, in ways that we haven't been able to change healthcare really. I mean, if you think about it. You know, when I go to my doctor, they ask me, you know, how well are you sleeping, or you know, how is your sleep? You know, maybe a, you know, and I'm like, well, it's okay, you know, and that means nothing to this doctor. Or how much are you, you know, how physically active are you? Uh, well, you know, I go to the gym three times a week. And what we, what we discovered is going to the dream, gym three times a week means nothing if you're sitting at your desk at work, um, you know, for the other uh, 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 seven days of the week, right? Um, and so imagine now when you go to a doctor, it's like, well, how is your sleep? Well, my sleep is like, you know, uh, maybe decreased or increased or, you know, my sleep is actually now I have real data. It's not what I'm interpreting in my own head about how my sleep is. I can actually see that I have apnea or that I wake up every 15 minutes. Or I can see that I'm sleeping six hours when I thought I was actually sleeping eight. I mean, this is the kind of data you go visit a doctor in, you know, in the near future and, and they're, they don't have to ask you those questions. They, has your, they have your graph. They know how you've been doing. Um, and they're like, here's, here's like three things you're going to need to do. It's going to be radically different. This is this takes it yeah, one what is stage. This? So this takes it one stage further. This is a concept we did with the Bill Gates Foundation and Wired Magazine, um, which um, is analyzes um, uh, blood, analyzes um, um, uh, urine, analyzes uh, spit, and essentially it it it's, um, it, it follows. It, it, helps, it helps developing, you know, uh, people in developing countries kind of follow up on their conditions. And this is from, from trips I've done around the world where I realized that, for example, with malaria, um, often people have to walk 45 minutes to an hour for a simple sort of follow-up um, uh, visit to a doctor. And that is usually what kills people, the fact that, you know, they may be busy, they may be collecting food, they may be... And that trip is actually... Um, they may skip it three months in a row, and when, when they get back to the doctor, um, they have some kind of you know growth that can be terminal. Um, so so this allows through. And the other thing I discovered is um, I was just recently in Indonesia on some you know somewhat um, you know primitive islands, and everybody has a cell phone. People can. Everybody has a cell phone. I mean they're 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 fishing with. Um, you know, spears, and yet they, they have a cell phone. So, so this is a simple way to have uh, a sensor on the body that analyzes, you know, your vitals and uh, keeps track of, of um, you know, of a disease such as malaria. And that data, that data is simply getting uploaded on a standard phone or on a smartphone, but, you know, generally on a standard phone um, to, you know, to the local doctor that's a couple of hours, you know, an hour away or so. Are there some technologies that we're on the verge of, you know, or material science that are on the verge of happening that we may not collectively be aware of that you think are going to be transformative, curved glass, you know, some type of... I think, you know, I mean, to me, you know, curved glass is just going to be an opportunity for design or is an opportunity for design. Um, but, uh, but the technologies that are really kind of going to revolutionize health, for example, are the types of uh, biosensors, the types of um, um, you know uh, sensors around um, um, hydration and uh, sen you know. The, the, so there are those, some coming that we probably you know, haven't seen yet. 
Um, yeah, I mean, or, or, or they're, they're contained in larger machines today, right? They're, they're about this size, right? right. And, and they're about to become um, wearable. And, and when those technologies are wearable, um, simply the data that, 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 um, and the, the usefulness of those tests becomes something that, that you, know, you, you, can, you can do every day. You can, you can really um, interact with you know, the medical profession in completely new ways. What's the best way for technical? Are, are there more slides, or are we within here? That's it. That's it, great. Um, are there ways in which um, founders of companies who are non-design founders can work best with the design community? Is it best to, and it's very pragmatic, but is it best to hire a world-class designer to come in for three days, or is it better to hire an up-and-comer and have them there 50 hours a week? What would you I think I think the best thing is to have a long term plan for what how you want to deal with you know uh, partners and um, and that's true for designers or or other people who you think are going to be important for your startup but you know for me I've worked now twelve years with Herman Miller I've worked twelve years with jawbone I've worked um, you know it's like i you know i'm 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 perpetually um, thinking about the company, what are the opportunities that, that exist, what are the changing behaviors that we can, um, that we can affect. So, so this long-term engagement, and, and the, way, the way it works is, is rather than you know, paying only fees, what you, what, you, what you do is you make people a partner, you make people a shareholder. Um, and so everybody's incentivized and everybody has the exact same goals. Um, but but you, you, have, you know, just like Herman Miller, they have to, they think about working with you. And I mean, they've told me that they're like, we're going to work with you till you're dead. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, and that's, you know, that's really what creates groundbreaking, um, you know, history making companies is, you know, how you can, how you work with them over the years, how you become smarter, they become smarter, and how that interaction is something that keeps you know, making, building value for, 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 the, for, for, the, for the new business. How do you know when a product's ready to ship? Because you had someone like Steve Jobs who would just keep working on it and, and not yeah. let it out the door. And, you know, then you have other companies like Google, which just basically threw out the Google Glass and, you know, the battery lasts for two or three hours and it's kind of non-functional. Or Samsung, people generally agree, rush that watch out. But sometimes you get a lot of feedback. You're the developer community. What do you, what do you, how, how do you advise partners on when to ship? Uh, I have this discussion, this dialogue a lot with, with young startups. And you always get to the same conclusion. Ship when it's absolutely ready for prime time. Uh, work, keep working on it. Keep perfecting it. Because you only have you know, one chance. I mean, there is no beta in hardware. Um, you, you know, you, you really have a single chance to really wow people, to make them want to sort of keep it uh, and use it every day and love it. Um, and and you, should, you should put everything in your corner possible um, to, to, to make sure you get to that point. What's the product, when you look back on the last 25 years professionally doing this, um, that you say, God, I wish I had designed that. Is there a single product or products that you look at right. and say, my God, that, that's what I would want? Because, I mean, obviously you're tremendously successful at this amongst the greatest, but, you know, certainly there's some film I mean, directors who look at another director they, and say, I, I wish mean, I had made that film. Yeah, I mean, they're important, beautiful, incredible, you know, products throughout, throughout the last hundred years that, of course, I could always say, I wish I had done that, but I mean, you, you know, you don't well, spend your life. Which one do you appreciate you know, the most? But I mean, you know, things like the Eames, you know, rocking chair is like, it's like something that I think, you know, kids from three years old to people who are, you know, 80 kind of will enjoy. So that's a great product. But when I was, when I was, um, I think 12 or 13 years old, maybe 14, um, my aunt sent me a Walkman and it was an extraordinary experience because um, I could now sort of carry the music of my, you know, adolescent years. I could carry it around, and I could plug a second headset in it, 
and you know have my girlfriend kind of listen to the same music, um, and so and and without you know the interception of adults, right? So when you're like that age, it's it's very rewarding because back then I could listen to my crazy punk music and I would get no remarks from anyone about how it was offensive to them in their ears. Yeah. So, um, so that, that was sort of a, um, a big aha moment for me. Uh, but at the same time, the product had like very funny idiosyncrasies, which I noticed back then, even though I, you know, I was just in the very, very early stages of being interested in design. And one was the orange button. I don't know if you remember. On the yeah. Walkman, there was an orange button, which allowed you, when there were two headsets, to speak to the person who I was at the other this. end of the wire. Yeah. <laughs> and, and to me, that, so you would like press on it, and, it would be, and the volume would go down in both. And then there was a microphone, and you could, go, you could talk to the other person. And I was like, well, where did this go? <laughs> yeah. Like they spent another $5 in the bill of materials of that product to add something which was just about uh, well, you what know, do you a, think a very simple gesture. Yeah. So, so, and obviously no other products like this ever launched with a, with a microphone yeah. and a button so you could keep them on. But A uniquely Sony innovation. Uh, so <laughs> where did Sony go wrong? Because I assume when you were coming up in the 80s, you were absolutely in love with Sony's product line. I mean, mm -hmm. they were the height sure. of design even long before Apple, really. Yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, they were, you know, they, they, they took over from where Brown was. Yeah. Um, um, and, um, and, really, and really created a lot of products people love, you know, like uh, uh, in, in music and, and, and the whole Sony style, you know, it's kind yeah. of technology or, or audio products being something that, that you can... Um, d d you know, that really cater to different tastes was something that was really significant. Um, you know, I think, I think they became, I, th I think the, the story is that they became very, um, uh, you know, they distanced themselves really from, from innovations and insights, and they became very much about the, you know, the internal thinking and the internal politics. And there's also a big sort of uh, a problem with Sony, and I had some experience there, which is a, a very big non-invented, not invented here mentality, which is a big no-no for any company, big or small, by the way. Um, when, when, when people become, you know, uh, want to hold all of the chips, all of the power, all of the, and, and, and are reluctant to listen to the outside world. I think you know that as, a, as an investor, yeah. um, as, a, as a founder, I mean, as a, as a funder of companies, um, that that's kind of an immediate no-no, right? Right. When you're like talking to, um, to, a, to, to a startup and, and they don't seem to be very receptive to, to sort of outside influence, um, that seems to be dangerous. Yeah. Um, and I think that happens to very big companies, but I see it happen to, um, to, to, to startups as well. Apple without Steve Jobs, what do you think it's going to be like the next couple of years for them? I think Apple has an incredible internal culture and dedication to the craft of making products that people, um, that people want. And so I think you know, Steve's biggest achievement is actually to have created um, the whole of Apple, um, to, have, you know, to, have had, you know, to, to have some of the most incredible engineers, some of the most incredible designers, some of the most incredible uh, teams really to kind of put these products out there. So the, I, to me, the culture is intact. I think there is a lot of impatience right now for what is next, right? They're, they've, they've just passed the three-year cycle of, you know, a new product that's significantly, that we want, you know, a new product that's going to change the world. Um, and so, no pressure. You know, we're, we're, no, you know, that, that is maybe an, an undue expectation for anyone. Um, for any company, but that's what people are uh, expecting, so that's something that they have to deal with now. And clearly it's going to be the watch. In your mind, I believe, you think mm -hmm. it's going to be the watch is the next thing. Some device. Uh, right, uh, you know, if you read the press, <laughs> yeah. uh, the watch is, is the next thing, but they're, they're good with their secrets. <laughs> what did you think of the, the Mac Pro, the cylinder, you know, new desktop computer? I, I think it's it's the perfect kind of conclusion to a product that is probably you know we're not going to be using a lot, but we use a lot of desktop machines because we need the power, 
um, um, you know, for a lot of the high-end software that we use, and that's going to be a really, really beautiful, you know, product, a beautiful object. Um, but you know, imagine if they had launched that, you know, ten years ago, the excitement that it would have generated. I think, I think it's um, it's a smaller product category now. Yeah. You know. Okay. Eve Bahar, incredible uh, advice for us. Thank you so much for sharing your uh, Thank vision you. on design. Well done. Thank you so much. Thank that you. was awesome.